After what Tory and Labour together have done to us over the last four years, uh, four years, they will never ever get my vote. In fact, I don't think any establishment party will ever get my vote. I appreciate honesty and common sense. The question I'm asking is you. How do you know who to trust? 0344 499 1000. With me to discuss this, but in a roundabout way, uh, is Henry Hill, acting editor, Conservative Home, and my Indian political commentator. This question was prompted by how the, um, the, the debate over uh, reform candidates has moved on a little bit today. Rishi Sunak, um, Henry, has come out with a very um, sort of uh, personal response to the um, racist remarks about him, particularly deeply offensive remarks. And he's also said, take the gloves off when it comes to fighting and challenging reform. This is what they are. People should know this and you shouldn't vote for them and so forth. On the other hand, you got Nigel Farage suggesting quite strongly without naming it that it's all a bit of a stitch up, something sleazy, something's wrong here about the Channel 4 broadcast that exposed this guy Andrew Parker and one of Farage's closer aides um, for both homophobic and the racist comments. Um, if you were looking at this from outside and you were a wavering voter, you know, it is that question. Who do you trust? Who, who, do you believe some of the theories going around that it's a stitch up uh, if you're the voter? Or do you do you look at Rishi Sunak and think, yeah, uh, you know, I, I trust this guy. I think he's he's been honest and straight and candid here. It's a bit of a dilemma. Tell me, where do you stand on the Farage comments? Uh, sorry, the comments by reform. Do you see the conspiracy theory? No, it's never. It's. It's I hate to when you work, when you write about politics you, you come to the depressing realization that it's never a clever conspiracy ever. Uh, it is always just the tawdriest, most boring possible explanation for anything. It's always <laughs> the explanation that's the case. And you know, the idea that Channel Four hired I think the, the implied claim is that they yeah. hired an actor yeah. and then inserted him into the reform campaign like months in advance, yeah. um, and embedded paid him. him properly in the machine, paying him all the while just so they could do this. Which, by the well, way, they can't... Uh, well, hang on, no, do, we should just add, they absolutely can't... Yeah, they, they can't... Yeah, but, but it's this. just like, but, like that sort of planning, that meeting where that happens... Well, just, I don't think I, that is what's been suggested. That was the first time he'd ever been out canvassing. Well, I mean, I could, whatever, paying him in, in any capacity, I think it's just, it's just ridiculous. Person, my personal view, but uh, and on the conspiracy, it, and, and he, yeah, yeah. Well, the conspiracy is ridiculous. And if Michael Farage really thinks it, he can, he can, he can say it. It is actionable, and and, and Channel Four will sue him into the ground. Mm. But if he has the courage of his convictions, he can say it. Ultimately, the problem that that Farage has is that historically he has the one thing he has been pretty good at generally is keeping the far right out of whatever party he's in. Not perfect, no. but generally. The one, whatever you think of Farage personally, he's kept fascists out of UKIP. He kept fascists out of the Brexit party. And at the beginning of this campaign, we had the discovery from the Times that yeah. 40 of his candidates were Facebook friends with the capital F leader of the British fascists and so on. We've had some of them publicly peddling anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. And he didn't take really swift action. And if he'd taken really swift action on that, then when this video came to light, he could have just done the same thing again. And I think the public, including me, would have been prepared to say, OK, look, you can't control everyone who comes in, but you can kick them out. The fact that he has, in previous weeks, stood by candidates who said truly unacceptable things means that his complaints about this ring a bit hollow. This right? is the difference between Farage in 2015 and Farage now. He's spent the last few years learning the Trump playbook, and this even suggesting the conspiracy it's classic, you know, disinformation. It clouds it, doesn't well, it? Well, this we've never had quite had an election like this because this is the first change election when distrust in politics has actually been high. And obviously, we had 2010 last time. I think we assumed at the time that was kind of the nadir. Actually, at this point, no one's really enthused by the mainstream parties. We're facing arguably people talk about is this 1992? Is it 1974? Mm. Is it 1964? It's actually more like 2001, where people assume the inevitability of a Labour victory, but turnout will probably be quite low. Except add into that dimension now social media, the internet, people can build their own reality into it. And there's just enough in there for people to assume that Nigel Farage could be telling the truth. And lots of people assume there isn't a jot of difference between Labour and the Conservatives on this. Um, Henry and I both know that isn't true. There's plenty of differences on fundamental issues. 
Okay. But if I were a reform, I'd ask my £100,000 back from that candidate vetting company because they clearly didn't do their job properly. OK, press the word on the conspiracy theories before we move, m move on. I've always, when I've ever been confronted with conspiracy theory, and it's normally against the government, I do point out that actually either a party or a government, for example, that can't even organise an election launch without it getting rained on, are hardly going to be capable of making a huge conspiracy. And I'm, I agree with you, Henry, these conspiracy theories generally don't hold up. Should they be given out? Of course people are allowed to, to, to vent their opinions. Fundamentally, do you sense, both of you, a sort of yes-no answer this, that uh, coupled with the Putin remarks, coupled with this, that there will be soft Tories perhaps thinking, mm, maybe I'm pulling back because the politics behind this is all about that, isn't it? There will be some in, in terms of voters. I'm not sure how many, but what this has done is it has really shored up the cordon sanitaire between the Conservative Party and Reform mm. afterwards mm. because there was talk from some candidates about offering Merging, Farage yeah. the whip and all of that. And what I'm hearing is that leadership candidates, prospective leadership candidates behind the scenes, nearly all of them are just assuring party members they will not strike a deal. Future of the Conservative Party? It depends what the number of seat count is next week and how close Reform get in terms of votes. It will be a very interesting dynamic. Can Fr Will Farage be back in the Tory parliamentary party? I don't think so. He values his own brand and platform too much. And also he has a history of coming in and coming out and he'll yeah. probably move on to America, presumably, if Trump um, uh, gets oh, elected. Oh, he has if said he's, not. He well, said no, he's uh, unless he's elected. Years. Obviously, if he's yeah. elected. No, it'd be different if he's elected, I suspect. Um, OK, right, VAT on school fees. All right, Gillian Keegan has come in. I, this is talked about a lot in the election. She said basically 40,000 people according to research, are going to go back into the state system. This VAT on fees, um, Mike, it still reeks of ideology. You've got half the cabinet who went to private school, the other half send their kids there. Now they want to make it difficult for other people. They're calling it getting rid of a tax concession. It's, you know, it's a tax rise, whichever way you look at it. It is ideology, isn't it? I mean, Labour raising taxes, Labour's going to do what Labour's going to do in that space. They have... This has been very carefully calibrated. They've got a very select t tax rise. What I'm more concerned about is what happens when Labour gets in and this narrative that's been going on around, you know, that says, oh, we've costed everything in the manifesto. But mm. what, what about beyond that? We all know they're going to start raising revenue from other areas as well. They're already looking at things like equalising the capital gains tax bans looking at reforms to inheritance tax, looking at equalising, uh, reforming the... That's before they get to the fuel or things like that. Even. Exactly. Mm. So there are... There's a fundamental difference here, but I think whoever's in government would need to either cut spending or raise revenue. That's the... The IFS has been very... The Inter Institute yep. Fiscal has been very clear about that. In this point, I don't think it's going to play badly with Labour's base. The issue then becomes Labour needs, needs to find the teachers, the school spaces for people, <laughs> and it will push people into the state sector. There's universal agreement with this, but it does throw the gauntlet down, and hopefully it will encourage Labour to invest in the state system. If they do that, then the policy is worthwhile. Old-fashioned ideology at play in Labour. Does it point to what Labour are really going to be like when they get in? Well, yeah, sort of. Sort of. In as much as it's one of only two policies they've tax policies they've really talked about. The other mm. one being this kind of um, non-doms thing, and that and it raises a as well, right? trivial amount of money, really. And it's re it is deeply unfortunate because yes, it displaces people into the state sector, and it's important to remember what that means. Mm. Every child educated in the private sector, and there are six hundred thousand of them or more. Mm is a child whose parents pay all their taxes that go towards the state school system and then don't get any of it back because they then pay additionally for their child to be educated separately. So every child that goes back into the state sector is, what, five-ish thousand pounds mm. per child per year? It's a double hit. Right, so that we have to find. Secondly, only half of private schools are charities. Mm. So half of them are already completely private. They don't get the VAT exemption. They are allowed to make a profit. The other half are charities, they, they, are, they can charge lower fees because they're not charging VAT, they can't make a profit and all of that money is reinvested back into education, which I think actually is a really well-targeted charitable mm -hmm. status because mm -hmm. currently what's going to happen is said is those rich parents who are the, you know, the parents who have been just about able to afford the fees, what's the alternative for them in the state sector? You buy a house in, an, in a catchment area <laughs> of a good school because yeah. that's how the state system <laughs> and selects more expensive. and that means that actually instead of being paid directly to a charity that educates children the money from those fees is going to be paid to a bank for a mortgage it's just a, it's a terrible policy everything this you've just said demonstrates this is nothing about leveling up or down this is about the politics of envy right do you think that there's grounds as suggested i think it's in the times today mike that the labor party could find themselves on the end of legal action against this i mean look this is I think quite possibly there's been a very firm lobby by the private schools, a trade body, against the policy as well. As Henry said, it's one of the only two 
tax rises really that Labour's talking about at the moment. There will be a lot more in that, you know, in the second Reeves budget once they've had a winter crisis in the NHS, or because the cost of government borrowing are just so high. And the debt stock, crucially not the deficit, but the debt stock we have as a country is double what it was in 2010. Thank you very much, the last five Conservative chancellors, for that. The issue becomes okay. how much of a hill this is going to be for it to die on for Labour and how much they're willing to invest in the state sector because ultimately the public will probably forgive them if they use it to improve state education. And the 6,500 teachers that Starmer is pledging are nowhere near enough, but he has said himself it's a down payment, so it's a gauntlet. Starmer's effectively making himself a challenge that he, Rachel Reeves and Bridget Phillipson have to meet over the next five years.